Hello again everyone from Tokyo, Japan and welcome back to Japan Vintage Camera where I'm coming to you uh, once again from my favorite place for making camera videos and that is the Hinokicho Park here in central Tokyo. Uh, it's been kind of a, a, a weird week with crazy and cold weather. Uh, today is not as bad as it has been. Uh, yesterday a big storm blew through Tokyo and it was uh, it looked serious enough as it was approaching that uh, uh, the government issued a, a, har a huge number of warnings and things like that. Things were like uh, uh, snow change for taxis and trucks and things like that. Uh, some schools where kids have to commute long distances were uh, closed uh, for the day. And there was a kind of sellout business for things like snow shovels and snow blowers uh, at hardware stores around the city. And then, uh, of course, we had these uh, handy public service bulletins on the news telling people to walk carefully and watch their uh, step when going up and down stairs and things like that. And after all this drama, we ended up with almost no snow yesterday. It turned out to be mostly rain. Uh, we did get a little bit of snow, but not as much as uh, all the kids were looking forward to. But that's just the way the things that things go here. Whenever there's a big snowstorm which paralyzes things here, it tends to come and catch us by surprise. Where when we prepare and go to uh, a lot of trouble to get ready for a severe storm, it turns out not to be severe. So, But uh, on the positive side, uh, walking around today, I can definitely see signs of spring approaching. Uh, the plum blossoms are starting to bloom. And that's always uh, something which I enjoy. The plum blossoms are very beautiful. I actually think they're more beautiful than the cherry blossoms here, but uh, the plum blossoms are not, qu not quite as popular. And the weather in February is still not as pleasant as it is in later months. Uh, we have a few different uh, plum trees here around the park, and a couple of them are starting to show a fair amount of blossoms. Uh, the other ones haven't started yet. Uh, later in the spring, early summer, we have plums here, which the kids tend to pick and throw at each other or, or uh, throw into the pond or whatever. But uh, uh, a good sign of spring approaching. Uh, the buds on the cherry trees in the park are getting very big, so we should have a very good cherry blossom season this year. There's no way to predict exactly when it's going to come. Usually figure around uh, the first week of April is the most likely time that you're going to see the cherry blossoms here, but it can sometimes be after the second week of April or sometimes the second week of March. It depends on a lot of things. So uh, yeah, it's quite difficult, but uh, hopefully they come in a timely manner this year. And I hope to make some videos of uh, the plum blossoms uh, or, uh, well, I guess cherry blossoms when they come out. which should be maybe uh, six weeks from now. Anyway, let's go ahead and get started with the subject of today's video. I know it's been almost three minutes into the video, but uh, a lot of people seem to be interested in what's going on in here in Tokyo. So I usually use the first part of the video to uh, talk a little bit about that. But anyway, subject of today's video is going to be another Konica rangefinder camera. In this case, it's going to be the Konica S3. For those of you who are new to my channel, I sell vintage Japanese cameras in my online store, japanvintagecamera.com. I have an Etsy store, which is also called Japan Vintage Camera. So if you'd like to buy this uh, old Konica rangefinder camera or another vintage Japanese camera, please visit one of my stores. I'll post links to my stores in the description below the video. So uh, the Konica S3 camera was a uh, 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 Konica's first attempt at making what I would call a more modern rangefinder camera. After the number series, uh, the Konica 1, 2, 3, 3A, and 3M, uh, the, you know, there was a lot of technological progress in uh, cameras and photography in those days, and Konica kind of jumped into this with their Auto and S series. They made a camera which was called the Auto S, which had a, a CDS battery-powered light meter. They had another camera which was called the Auto S2, and then there was the Auto S16, and all these had battery-powered light meters, but they also had this camera here, which was the S3. And the S3 was a little bit different from the other cameras in that it featured a selenium light meter, which didn't require a battery. Uh, the S3 was introduced in uh, 1963, I believe it was, and uh, this is the one camera, I think, which is uh, the later model cameras, which is the most similar to, uh, say, the Konica uh, 3A. I'm wondering if like the Konica S3 was something like the Konica 3 with an S put on the other end of it or whatever. And the reason I say that it's a lot like the 3A is that the viewfinder in this camera is very much like the 3A. Uh, the 3A viewfinder, the earlier Konica 3A, was a masterpiece in rangefinder photography. It's one of the best viewfinders which uh, was made in the 1950s uh, in Japan. And it featured a very solid construction of glass prisms and a, a cool system where the, the viewfinder, the, the frame lines in the viewfinder adjusted for both parallax 
and image distance. So not only do they move kind of diagonally from uh, left to right as you get closer or farther away, focus closer or focus farther away, the frame lines get larger or smaller because as you are focusing, uh, the subject, uh, uh, as the lens moves, gets larger or smaller on your film. And so cameras like the 3A offered a, uh, a, the most accurate possible way of, uh, I guess, uh, correctly, uh, what do I say, composing your subject or uh, using uh, the most accurate system for focusing a rangefinder camera. It worked really well and luckily you can find that system here on the Konica S3. The only difference is the Konica S3 made it a little bit simpler and less expensive by removing the solid glass prisms in the top of the camera and replacing them with a combination of lenses and mirrors which work just as well but are uh, 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 less expensive to make and easier to repair. So let's go ahead and look at the features, controls, and functions and how to use the Konica S3. Starting at the top here, we have the uh, film rewind knob, which uh, pops out. Uh, this is uh, some of the cameras of this era used a, a lever on either side, which you had to move up or down to uh, uh, open the film door. This one has the more modern style where you simply just lift it up and the film door pops open. There's a handy plastic tip on the end which rotates as you turn which uh, makes it a little bit easier to rewind the film. This is actually an improvement over the earlier cameras. Over here we have a shoe for mounting a flash gun. This is a cold shoe. If you're going to use a flash gun you're going to have to connect it to this uh, PC sync socket here on the front. Uh, if you lift up and, and pull off this uh, shoe on the top here you'll find the access hole for the vertical adjustment for the rangefinder. Uh, you can turn that one way or another and that will align the, the vertical setting and so if you've got one of these cameras where the rangefinder adjustment is off, which sometimes happens, quite easy to fix. Next to that we have the uh, window for the light meter. Now there are two ways that you can use the light meter in this camera. You can either use it by looking through the top of the camera, so you have the camera set, say set on a tripod like I have this, uh, my video camera here. And you can look through the top here, and as you adjust the shutter speed and aperture, you can make the meter needle move. And what you want to do is you want to line up that meter needle with the uh, center post. Uh, when it's lined up that way, then it means that uh, your uh, aperture and shutter uh, speed are set you know, for the correct, uh, to get the correct exposure for the available light. Uh, this uh, meter system is also visible through the viewfinder. So if you look through it, you can hold the camera up to your eye and make the adjustments without having to look at the top of the camera, uh, which makes it a little bit more accurate and easier to use. On this side here, we have the shutter release button, which accepts a standard cable release. And here we have the film winding and shutter charging lever. On the back of the camera, we have the viewfinder eyepiece, which uh, turns out to be the same size as you would see on the earlier Konica 3A camera. We have this big plastic bezel around here which uh, protects you from scratching your glasses and here there's a little bit of a small cap screw and if you remove this cap screw with a, a pair of uh, a tweezers or something like that underneath you'll find the screw for the horizontal adjustment of the range finder. So uh, quite easy for uh, you to service the range finder yourself in this camera and most of the other uh, Konica cameras are the same. On the bottom of the camera here we have a standard quarter inch tripod socket and we have the release button which you have to depress before you rewind the film. Uh, moving to the front of the camera on the top right here we have the uh, uh, I guess this is the Fresnel glass which covers the selenium light meter. A selenium light meter is powered by the light it doesn't require a battery to operate which uh, is wonderful because you never have to worry about getting a, a battery for these cameras but uh, selenium can degrade over time. It does degrade or it doesn't. It depends on the, the sample of the camera you have and how well it's been stored and taken care of. Uh, the one on this camera still appears accurate, which is a, a lucky thing. Above that we have this kind of uh, uh, opaque plastic thing here and this is what allows the light to go into the camera so you can see the light meter readout inside the viewfinder. Moving over here we have the uh, rangefinder window and we have this matte glass around it. This allows the light to go onto the rangefinder mirror and the matte glass here diffuses the light as it goes onto the projected frame line. So it's not too bright when you're looking through the viewfinder. Uh, you can make it very bright by just putting a plain piece of glass in here but it becomes so bright it kind of distracts, makes it a little bit more difficult to uh, compose. And I've discovered this accidentally by uh, forgetting to put this glass in when I was working on one of these cameras. And of course here you have the viewfinder window itself. Uh, this camera has a very large and bright viewfinder and as I said it has the wonderful uh, 
a moving frame line system which came on the earlier Konica 3A. Um, next, next we move to the front of the camera. We have the focusing tab here and we have a focusing scale located on the top left here which is arranged in both meters and feet. Uh, we also have the uh, indicator arrow here for when you are adjusting your aperture. There's a smaller dot on the front for adjusting the shutter speed. Uh, we have an aperture range of uh, f1.9 to f16. Uh, some of the other cameras, like, I think with the 48mm lens, went up to f22. Uh, but this was causing a, a diffraction in the images in, in the cameras. And uh, uh, in, the, in this camera here, the S3 uh, Konica got rid of the uh, f22 setting. Uh, I guess you know, they were getting complaints of the quality of the images being shot at f22. And f16 is, is perfectly fine. And uh, it's kind of hard to notice any diffraction at f16, though you do get a fair amount at f22. Uh, right here we have the lever for the self-timer. Uh, and as always, I recommend uh, not using the self-timers on these old cameras because they are prone to sticking. And the ones on the, the Konica S3 are especially prone to sticking. If you have one of these cameras where uh, the shutter's not firing and it won't wind, there are two things you have to do. The first thing you have to do is see if the shutter uh, blades are stuck. And on this camera, you can do that very easily, much more easily than other cameras. This entire front part here screws out from the inside that is inside here if you take a, a rubber stopper or rubber ball and you push it around the lens and the lens nameplate and turn it leftwards you should be able to get it loose and the whole thing will screw out don't turn the filter ring that's locked in place you just have to turn out the inside when that comes out that gives you access to the shutter blades the aperture blades and the inside uh, of the glass for the lens elements uh, the first thing, if you have a jammed up camera, put a drop of solvent or lighter fluid or something on the, the shutter blades and give them a touch with your fingers. And normally, uh, the issue is stuck shutter blades. Uh, the shutter will either fire or the self-timer will start working because the shutter has to move slightly before the self-timer starts unwinding. It doesn't open or close, but there's kind of a, as the mechanism moves, uh, it will unlock the uh, self-timer and will start to wind down. Uh, if the, the shutter blades are stuck and the self timer is over on the left, it's never going to move. If you get the shutter, shutter to move a little bit and the self timer is still stuck, you can put a few drops of uh, solvent or lighter fluid uh, with the self timer pointing upwards so the gravity pulls the solvent down inside. Often that will uh, loosen up the mechanism and if it doesn't turn by itself, it should at least loosen it up to where you can push it gently with your thumb and it will wind down. And once it gets to this position, the shutter should fire. The good thing about this camera is that this uh, release lever isn't in the way of the aperture ring. You can adjust it quite easily without accidentally hitting the self-timer. I did a review the other day about the Petri Racer and I found that most of the times when I was playing with the shutter speed ring on that camera I was also catching the self timer which was really annoying. Uh, that's not an issue on this camera. Alright, moving forward we have the shutter uh, uh, speed selection ring and we have a full range of speeds on the Copal shutter here from B and 1 second all the way up to 1 500th of a second. Uh, this camera, they kind of uh, re-engineered the, uh, the maximum speed, so you don't have that like extra twist that you need to get to the 1-500 speed. And uh, there's no increased tension when you're winding the shutter when it's at the maximum speed. This is a common problem in some other cameras when you choose the, the maximum speed. There's a booster spring and it makes the, the winding lever or a shutter speed ring harder to turn. Uh, I've mentioned before that some people have complained to me that they think you know that this is a problem with the camera. It's not a problem. It's normal, but luckily it's not an issue in this particular camera. A cool thing about this camera is it has an excellent lens. Uh, the most popular uh, Konica lens of that era was the 48 millimeter f/2, and uh, I think Konica just lightly tweaked that lens a little bit in some ways and came out with the 47 millimeter f1.9 which performs the same as the 48 millimeter f1 point or f2 but being in the one range 1.9 range i guess made uh, some uh, an improvement in the marketability of this camera because faster lenses were starting to become more of a thing in those days as uh, faster film speeds uh, well, not faster film speeds but uh you know the limitations of uh film speeds i should say uh were uh were still something to overcome. Uh, faster speed, faster shutter speeds with uh, slower speed films made it possible to take uh, uh, better uh, photographs in low light conditions. And for myself, I usually don't, I'm not going to be using a handheld rangefinder camera in dark conditions if I can help it, unless I'm using a tripod or something like that. 
but uh, or unless I if I'm shooting something like the uh, uh, you know, c certain cameras which have a, a larger range of speeds like the you know, uh, say the the V2000 or, or the V2 or V3 uh, but yeah uh, good enough range for what we had available at the time now, overall these are an excellent camera if you find one and uh, if you find one of these cameras, you get it off eBay or a pawn shop or a thrift store or something like that, or you find one in a box at a, a garage sale or something, and it, it probably isn't going to work. But luckily, this camera, compared to other more complicated cameras, this one's a little bit easier for, uh, uh, I guess, amateurs to work on or repair. Already mentioned how to adjust the uh, uh, rangefinder's camera by under the shoe here or behind this plastic cover on the back. And I explained how you can remove the lens to fix something like a stuck shutter or a, a stuck uh, self-timer lever. If you need to take the camera apart to uh, clean the viewfinder and rangefinder uh, assembly, that's actually quite easy. Simply pull, twist this nut off. You can do it with your thumb usually. And you can remove the winding lever. Uh, you can open the film door. And putting a screwdriver or something in, in the forks, you can take off the rewind lever. That'll expose... Uh, a screw and a nut on the top which you can remove and lift off the top cover and then you can easily clean off the glass on the inside and then just put it back together and for a fairly minimal amount of work and time you can have a really good camera with an excellent lens and an ex excellent viewfinder rangefinder system anyway uh, that's it for my video today I've got to get back home uh, shade is starting to come over here the big building on the left the Sun's going behind it. it's gonna get really cold when I get out of the sunshine uh, I plan to be making more videos uh, soon. I'm trying to get a video out every other day. So if you'd like to see these videos, uh, please subscribe. Uh, if you like these videos and would like to see more videos, uh, please hit the like button. That always helps. Uh, thank you very much for watching, and I hope you tune in again soon.